Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this uh, talk organized by Soul Collective. Tonight, uh, we have a, a special guest, uh, Stan Padilla, and this talk is part of a project uh, called uh, Chicana Chicano Chicanex Mexican that includes a virtual uh, exhibition by different artists from the United States and Mexico as well as a series of uh, talks by uh, uh, some of the uh, exhibiting artists as well as some other artists and a panel discussion. Uh, so this project was in part uh, funded by the uh, Gente Chicana Soymos Chicanos Art Fund and the Greater Milwaukee Foundation. And this project uh, what is looking is to uh, highlight uh, different uh, artists uh, in our communities, that, uh, artists that have been involved in different levels, in different ways in our communities, um, whose production has been leaving a mark in, in the different communities they have been interacting with. And just to uh, start with this uh, art offering today, and before uh, passing the mic to uh, Estampadilla. I also want to invite you to attend the different other talks that are going to be happening. Uh, the next one will be next week with uh, Hilda Posada. And then uh, on Tuesday, then on Thursday, we will have uh, Luis Genaro Garcia. And there will be other talks later. And let me start with this uh, offering with a little uh, song movement uh, with a um, ocarina instrument um, welcome everyone Thank you very much and welcome. And now uh, let me introduce uh, Estampadilla. Estampadilla is a multimedia artist uh, with disciplines that include drawing, painting, muralism, and jewelry making. He's an indigenous educator, mentor, and currently is cultural mentor for the United Arbor Indian Community Tribal School. He's one of the principal mural painters and activists of the Royal Chicano Air Force Art Collective he has been using art, education, and direct action as a means to help create restorative justice in all restorative justice change for over 50 years. He's a family man, father, grandfather, great-grandfather, a godfather, mentor to many community members and young artists. He lives and works in rural uh, Placer County on a 13 acre art sanctuary where he maintains traditional teaching, mentoring, gardening, and health relative, relatives active, health related activities. Uh, welcome Estampadilla, uh, it's an honor for us as all collected to have you here uh, as in part of this project and, and I pass the microphone to you. And at the end of uh, the presentation by Stan, we're going to have a chance for Q&A. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your time. I'm humbled to be asked to speak like this. For those of you who know me, you know I'm a little bit shy. I don't seek the limelight. I, I don't like attention drawn to myself. But when Soul Collective calls, I listen. And I'm going to speak a little more open tonight uh, because of uh, my connection to Soul Collective, to the community there. So a lot of things can be said about a person. I, I just live my life. I don't follow all the things that are said about me. I don't believe most of them anyway. 
I, I've been fortunate, blessed, or cursed by a lot of public attention, a lot of uh, accolades and all of that. But I always look at it like uh, some other person out there, you know, because I'm, I'm just here, you know, doing my laundry, uh, keeping up the studio, doing my best at living my life uh, in a very, uh, how, how would we say, I like to live my ordinary life and in a very extraordinary way. I've been extremely blessed in my life. Uh, I was born, I'm speaking to you tonight in rural Placer County. It's dark, it's cold. We were the epi epicenter of the river fire during the summer. I was on alert, evacuation alert uh, all summer. We were the center of the recent snowstorms. I was snowed in for four days, didn't have electricity or power for 10 days. So it's been a challenging year. Um, I come from an older family. Uh, I was born and raised in a rural situation. Uh, I come from the working class. I maintain those values. I maintain my art making in that manner. I'm a working class artist. Uh, I don't seek a privilege or some kind of a vanguard uh, status as being an artist. I, I work hard at what I do. I work 24 seven. I come from an older family, a family that uh, we were desplazados. We were displaced people from our homelands. We're Yoeme, Mexican-American, Yaqui, Mexican-Americans. We became more Mexican-Americans because of our, um, the nature of the history of the Yaqui people. Uh, in the early 1900s, to escape persecution, we had to flee our homelands. The group that I am connected with, we were actually sold as um, slaves and taken from the south and brought up to the north to work in the gold mines, Placer Mining, Placer County, Placer County. It all comes from our tradition. We were silver miners uh, under the Spanish, in the Spanish colonial era. So when the Americans got tired of and wouldn't work for their gold anymore, we were brought up here, 150,000 people, uh, mainly men who then uh, intermarried uh, in the Mexican-American, Native American, Hawaiian-American, the Kanaka culture that was here, and among the uh, uh, Asian cowboy culture. It's a unique destiny that we have. Um, and so out of that, we worked on the ranches. I was not, we were not really uh, working the field so much. We worked in the ranches, maintained ranches. We, we made our own clothes. We grew our own food. We stayed out of the limelight because to identify ourselves at that time as Yaki meant uh, troubles. So I still maintain that life. I'm still quiet. I still live in the rural situation. Uh, art making is my direct action that I do in the world out of the expression of my life. I, you know, I'm an active gardener, as was mentioned, father, grandfather. Uh, this is my 50th year in the classroom situation in education. Uh, my specialty now are the little children. I love the little ones. And uh, so that's, that's what I've been doing, and I'll slowly get into my artwork here. As an activist, I have applied my creativity. I have applied my, tried my uh, belief in our culture, especially Norteño culture. 
I believe in us here in the north. And in a way, that's how I sort of uh, became a Chicano. I was uh, sharing with Luis earlier. We really didn't, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, early 60s, we didn't know who we were. We, we didn't call ourselves any of this name. We were busy working. We were busy trying to keep a, food, a roof over our heads. We didn't think about those things. And slowly we began to hear about this. Uh, I remember one of my, I was already traveling with my uh, artwork. And I remember one of my grandfathers said, uh, called me back to the area. And he said, there's this man speaking in the fields. I think you should hear him. His name is Cesar Chavez. He was mobilizing in the fields. He goes, I think you should come home and see this, what he's doing. And so I started following, I came home and started feeling, uh, following, feeling and learning people. That's when I became involved with the Royal Chicano Air Force um, and began uh, my activities there. I've been doing artwork since I was four years old. I do it every day. Multimedia artist, which means I have so many interests. Uh, I am dedicated to learning my craft, crafts, uh, the multimedia. Uh, well, I'm primarily known as a painter and for my public artwork, I have a lot of artwork that oftentimes is never seen. And, and I don't show it or maybe in the garden, maybe just give away for the kids. So I'm really uh, dedicated to the process of art. I have an informal and a love-hate relationship with the art, art cultural world, galleries and all of that. I never have been real interested in all that. I've been a good citizen, I'll participate. I've never asked for a show in my life. I've always asked, I do the work, and what I'm doing, if somebody sees it and they ask me to show, then I do, but I don't actively seek uh, an art career. My life uh, and my values are based around family, culture, art, and I live that way. I am a practitioner of Nahualismo, of the ancient traditions, of our peoples. Uh, I was fortunate to be raised around uh, older elders, ancianos, very old in their hundreds, who uh, escaped the homeland and came up here. I was uh, fortunate to be in the time and the generation and had the inclination to, to learn of these and I maintained this practice and so really that's where my art grows out of. I follow a symbolic, abstract, mystical tradition, a metaphysical tradition. I laugh because sometimes I don't even know if I ch do Chicano art or why I was always included because I don't, I just do what I do. I don't try to fit in anywhere or identify anything other than a human being trying to be a real good human being, you know, help people be kind to uh, help my community. But the artwork, uh, it has, it's like a language for me. I'm able to speak to something far greater, far deeper, than just the ordinary life. Well, I love my background and everything. I don't like ranch work and I don't like labor, the things we used to do. We grew up hunting and fishing and, and maintaining, but I always used to tell everybody, you know, I'm not gonna do this forever. You know, I wanna be a philosopher. You know, I, I wanna do these things, uh, other things. And, uh, and that's what I have, uh, search for, you know, 
as an active seeker, as an active uh, organizer, as an active uh, role model for others, you know. As I mentioned, we didn't really understand our culture, especially all of the cultural identification and fluidity today. There's many, so many degrees of, I don't know what to call it anymore. I accept it all. And I work hard in, in, my, in my work. I'm often, my kids call me a working class mystic because I, main, I maintain a, uh, a journey searching for my interests, for my life. I've traveled, been blessed to travel all over the world, not as a tourist, but uh, as a seeker of life. You know, I've been in temples, synagogues, pyramids, United Nations, places I don't even know what to call them, meeting people who I never thought were so different than me. But I always had this attitude in my life that being open-hearted, open-minded, and being unafraid to move beyond and, and to explore things. And that's what I do in my art. You know, I, uh, in looking back, at my history now, I am in sort of, uh, as you can see, I'm a man of color. I'm an artist of age. I've been uh, working at my art for over 70 years now. I'm sort of in the legacy phase of my life. I'm reflecting back and looking, reviewing, seeing what's valuable and begin to collect it now. The artwork and the background you see today are all part of a movie that I'm making. It's called The Paint Maker. I begin making paints and then reflect on my journeys and reflect on where I've been, what I've done, what's happened to me, what I've become. So different than what I was destined for in my family. I was kind of a savior meant to, I was the first in my family to be educated, the first to go into the English speaking world, the first to go out into mainstream society. And um, I was supposed to become something, a doctor, a lawyer, a pharmacist, or something like that. So. It was a little bit uh, disappointing to my family and how hard they worked to see the world that I have chosen, a world that was beyond myself, that dedicating myself to a more altruistic, helping the world to be a better place, helping people, a world that well, let me just say, this is where I, why I share my art, that it will help people to live a better life, to live a happier, more fulfilled life, to be kind to one another, to remember things. So again, looking back, um, I realize now I, as I enter my F8, uh, eight dec eighth decade, you know, I, I was blessed with a certain lifestyle that uh, I want to pass on to others now, not only to my children and my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren, but to all my godchildren and to establish it more. As I say, I'm still in the classroom. I worked all day today and it's, it's a difficult. I lost two students this month to COVID. It, it's heartbreaking. It's tough work. But I think education, arts education, and to enable and ennoble through education, people to become better and to reach higher and farther and deeper in their life is, is what I seek. Yeah. 
Well, I seek a natural life. You know, I, I'm a student of the stars and of nature, the animals. That's where I live, where I live, you know. Y'all see me in the city and see me on TV and see me in all those places, Facebook and everything. But most of the time I'm not wearing shoes or long pants or I'm working or, you know, always doing something, you know, that is uh, working to benefit uh, other people. I feel very blessed in the sense that at a very early age, I had a near-death experience. Technically, I died, but I heard the voice of my mother, and I came back. But what I saw when I was gone, that's what I try to put into my art. I try to explain what I saw in the world that is beyond this world. I was radicalized very early in my life. I woke up. I realized I didn't want to live as a colonial peasant or to work. I didn't come here to just pay bills and, and work and, and, and go to the movies and have a little vacation in Hawaii. That was not why I came. I had a mission. And, and that's what I've worked on my whole life, you know, and I have, I've worked to I, it's hard to explain my mind. I've tried to decolonialize my mind and my thinking. When we think about it in revolutionary activities and in my work in the 60s, 70s, you know, uh, working to establish ethnic studies programs, cultural centers, to revive and to collect. Uh, our culture was, was coming to a very abrupt halt and uh, acculturation was happening. We had to do something radical. We had to gather our soul again, our forces and bringing them out for the people and collect them. And that's what we did. We collected the symbols, the stories, the languages, the ceremonies, and we revived them again, not for ourselves, but for our communities. And we did that first that we had to ennoble our minds, not just to be reactionary, uh, political peasants, but to really be strategic in our thinking, to truly turn around our minds and grasp truths, the heart of education, the heart of what it means to be a people. And all of this I've shared with my work in my Art career, which I don't really have, it's a collection of work, but in this day, that's how they call it, an art career. Uh, my art has changed a lot. I've been through many stages, many forms. I'm clo getting closer now to the heart of what I um, meant to be and what I'm doing in this new series. I'm trying to change uh, uh, forms to bring a focus and it takes the mind, not just the body. When we're re, uh, uh, reawakened and, and how it is said today, radicalized, we realize that yes, our land was taken, our languages, our customs and our traditions. Those are secondary, our first is our minds were turned, our priorities were changed, our dreams were taken from us and were replaced with a new agenda. And that's what this art is, is a new way of reviving. It's in a sense, a soul retrieval. 
you know, to receive something back, the nobility of our true mind. In Nawalismo, we know that in the ancient traditions, our indigenous roots were in dreaming. We were a dream culture throughout the continent, throughout all the islands, to Hawaii, Samoa, Fiji, all over. We were a dream people. We dreamed our world into being. During the age of colonialism and imperialism, we were taught that we had to work and we had to labor and we had to have money. And we were learnt, taught a life that left very little time for us to dream anymore. But as we began to focus our minds, we began to gather and we began to collect another element of ourselves, a sort of what's now called a mystical things, things we can't speak about. There are no words sometimes. And this is what the ancient traditions taught us. I have been in the temples. I have been in Las Runas, as they're called today, the pyramids. Can you imagine Las Runas? They're ruined. That means they're no good anymore. They have no value. No, that's not true. What was done in those pyramids? What were the activities? Who was there? And why isn't it, is it being done anymore? Who are those people? So this new paintings that I'm working on is the entrance to the new temple. Re-entering again into this sacred space that is our everyday life. This I tell you as a working class mystic, but I'm talking about it's not going to church. I'm not much of a religious person. I, I don't go to church. I go to my studio. I work every day. I help people. It's in our everyday lives. That's where we revive and find our culture and get back to ourselves. So this new work, It's a new language. It's the ancient language. The language that cannot be spoken. It's not English or Spanish or Nahuatl. It's not any kind of communication like that. It's a recognition of the mind, of hearing and seeing what do the stars say? What's the language of water and fire? Why are we here? What are truths that last now you can see why I'm not real popular in galleries and so forth because I never I mean I'll participate in all that and I'm blessed to be you know have an art career and all that but it's this work is not for buying and selling and for marketing and, and, and investing in all that can be done, you know, and I, I honor everybody who does that. All the different kinds of art, uh, I honor. There's, there's all styles of art, all artists, all peoples. It's all relevant, and there's a part for everybody to play in at all. I just have to do what I do. And I don't, uh, frankly, at my age and my status now, I don't much care what other people say or do. I've gained more strength. I've been criticized for decades now. Now I'm beginning to be popular and to be sought after. And that I don't really care much about either. Gets to be a nuisance sometimes. I just want to do the work. So this, what you see me is, uh, behind me is the it's the beginning 
of entering this new portal, this new doorway, if we analyze and we look at our society, the human society, we are in unprecedented times, unprecedented changes and forms. My work is always addressed between things. You know, I've never been quite in the group. I've always been an older man in the younger group. I've been too traditional, not traditional enough. Uh, too light skinned, not dark enough. You know, uh, I've always found myself in between. So now I live in that in between, in this in between world now. The old world, the old colonial world that we were accustomed to, we watch it every day, don't we now? Like dominoes disintegrating before our eyes. And at the same time, the new, new collective, the new world is not quite here. We're straddling old and new, what's familiar, what's, what's strange to us, what is valuable, what is not valuable, what is health, what is living, what is dying, who's safe, who isn't, all of those things. And that's what I'm addressing here. Uh, eternal truths that last throughout all the ages, last throughout all time. Um, I don't quite know exactly, and I'm speaking very openly. I don't, as most of you know, I, I don't generally talk like this. I get things done and I don't hang around much. I gotta go, I gotta go to work. You know, I got, I got things to do. And uh, I feel really called to my mission in life, which is just to live a real good life, you know, be awake every day and do real good things and, and help people and, and get things done. You know, I'm, get, I'm getting ready right now in my garden, getting ready, you know, tilling the soil, you know. And in this new work, this new blue, the blue represents a, a new journey. In English, in high English, in the world of psychiatry and in the world of initiatory sciences, the mystical initiations, the world that we're living in now, the space we live in, the time, is called liminality. Liminality defines itself as that space in our evolution where the old life is not quite here, the new life is not quite here, and we live in a twilight world. In the rites of passage, when a young person, male or female, leaves their mother and gets initiated to be an adult, teenagehood and so forth. Think of teenagers, liminality. I'm not quite a child, but I'm not an adult yet. I'm playing with fire. I'm gonna get burnt. I learn things. That's where we are now in this world of liminality. Blue represents that world. You know, blue is the last color that our human species were, was able to perceive. It's a relatively new perception in the world, the color blue. There are only eight natural mineral substances that are natural blue all over the world. Lapis lazuli being the primary one. Blue is the foundation. Well, let me, let me step back. In the late 1890s, uh, 60s, when the first time we saw, when we saw astronauts go up in space and we saw the picture, 1967, of our Earth from space, that was the first time we collectively saw that blue gold orbit, uh, aura around the Earth. The whole world, we all saw that together. There have 
There has not been a new blue in 400 years. Ultramarine blue was the last collective blue color that we all, all experienced until this year. And what's known as Yin Min blue. It's a new blue uh, that I'm now working with. I'm one of 10 artists who was uh, blessed to receive the first waves of this paint uh, to be used because I've been working with the uh, scientists and universities for, you know, some 12 years now with the color. But it's a new way of seeing the world and that's what I'm bringing out in this blue. Uh, as a paint maker, the only way I could get the blue I wanted was to make it. And that's what I continue to do. Uh, the movie, uh, uh, the paint maker shows the process and what we've gone through, through light. Have to understand the principles of light. Now I'm going to get a little geeky here, you know, because in the studio, you know, the scientist has his laboratory, the scholar has his library. Um, the artist has the studio. There are, the studio is a very unique place to study, to build trust, to do experiments. It's a sacred space. Uh, for those who have been to my studio, and if you haven't, I invite you sometime to come visit. Uh, I post pictures of it occasionally. Uh, you know, it's part laboratory. Part chapel, part cave. And part meeting ground where all of these come together. Because in my work, this work doesn't talk. I'm not talking about me, my personality, what I think, what I think you should think or making any statements, any anything about any, I don't make general uh, statements of politics or, or anything. The work itself is the, is the journey. In 1967, my first was, my work was first recognized and it was uh, Rolling Stone magazine in the very early days, Ben Fong Torres. Uh, I think, I forget, and they're all deceased now. Mr. Gleason, I think he was the uh, 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 art critic for the San Francisco Chronicle, saw my work. And that what they talked about was that this work is not a picture of something, that the work was the journey itself that I was working that journey right on the work. So what I'm creating and what I'm doing and what I'm in incorporating, what's imbued in that work from the manner of my craftsmanship to the depth of my knowledge of uh, uh, poetic um, symbology and poetic geometry, all of the combination created a, um, a space and place of it on that the, that the paintings then were not just a painting or an illustration, but they were living, living work. So I continue in that tradition. Um, I'm gonna show you enter in this next, it's a little video. It, we're, we're beginning the entrance in the video that we're making. The real video begins once we go to the door and you'll see what I'm talking about here, beyond and entering that door. So uh, uh, let's see if we can get this to work. Excuse me. Aiden. I can't get this video to work. It's 
Is it going? So part meditation, part journey, part adventure. And what we're doing now in the film is creating the, in, in between each doorway, there are rooms and we're doing 360 activities in each room as we go from room to room going back. And then we enter the doorway where all forms that we know dissolve and then we go on an adventure in pure light and shape and form including the what will be included are the paintings in this series many of the paintings that are in the exhibition so if you want to see the virtual exhibition you'll start to see some of the work it's a montage we call it a uh, I don't even like the word video. Video is the uh, process. It's the verb, it's not the noun. What we're building is a compassionate, visual, ceremonial, videotape experience, a legacy experience. That's what we're uh, shooting for. So I think I better end here. And so we have a little time for questions and answers. Uh, you can see with each word, each sentence I've used, we could have gone in many different directions in all directions and never run out of time. It's, it's, it's a story, you know, it's a journey, it's a legacy. Uh, so maybe if we have questions or maybe we have comments or critique or criticism or you want to drop out, now's your time. Uh, thank you, Stan. Uh, that was a great talk. And if anybody has a question, uh, feel free to put it in the chat, or if you want, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask the question directly. Thank you very much. Hi. Hi. Hi, this is uh, Anita, I'm Paul's wife. We're watching together. Just wanted to thank Stan. That was a really uh, beautiful meditation experience. I felt like I was going into different portals. Like when I meditate and go into a different dimension, I visualize something like this. And I use the color of that door too. So I thought that was really cool, but I love it. It's very, um, a wonderful experience. So it was, it's really cool that it's uh, moving in, in video form. So thank you. So I hope it's, and again, I invite you one day to come to Peaceful Valley, just to be here, listen to the geese, watch the deer, hear the flutes, hear the drums, 
listen to the waters. The studio doesn't have a lock or a key, so it's often open. I shouldn't say that too loud, but if you come down my driveway, you better know where you're going. <laughs> Oh, Stan, uh, somebody's asking, uh, where from Mexico was your family from? We're from northern Mexico, Rio Yaqui, Become Estacion, they called it in those days, Become Station. It was the central uh, center of the Ocho uh, uh, Ciudades, the, the eight towns uh, of uh, Yaqui culture. Uh, my grandparents left due to political um, uh, persecution uh, at that time in the late 1800s people were either inscripted into slavery and to work in the hemp fields uh, going south in Maya land go to the Bacatete mountains to become a rebel or walk north and get amnesty and my family came north to Amnesty to Pascua. And then uh, at the time in uh, Pascua, uh, I would say in the early 20s, uh, uh, ethnic peoples and the Yaqui peoples could uh, ride the railroad. And so they jumped on the railroad and went north anywhere they could out of there to escape the persecution, the poverty. And so uh, anywhere that you see Old uh, railroad towns, Roseville, Manteca, uh, Shasta, any of the turning points, you will find Yaqui people. And uh, they just went north. My family went as far uh, north as uh, Mount Shasta to work in the lumber mills, to work, you know, in uh, up there and work in the ranches. And uh, I was the first to... Uh, after uh, the inscription, uh, they, they didn't have, uh, they weren't immigrants, didn't have green cards. It was an undeclared area of, of society. Yeah. Uh, I was the first to, I think my dad, because he went into the uh, World War II, got the benefits of American society. And my brothers and I were citizens. But I, I never asked my dad if he was a citizen. I don't think so. I think he just got, uh, because of his service, being a veteran, you know, and then. But we were down there, uh, still maintain uh, uh, connections and, and in the Southern Arizona uh, community as well. And the Northern uh, uh, California contingency of uh, Yoemi and uh, and at that time, it's a unique and it's still uh, occurring. Uh, our people uh, took on the cloak of the Mexican American society because we're close in, in culture. And um, and so it all came into one. But now, as things more and more, Yoemi are uh, waking up, recognizing themselves. Uh, uh, returning to their uh, root identities. It's safe now. In fact, we laugh and say it's real cool. You know, before it wasn't so cool. Nobody, everybody wanted to be a Mexican. <laughs> and now everybody, you know, was, wants to be Yoeme again, not even Yaki. You say Yoeme or Hayaki, you know. Again, it, it's cool but we have a lot of history. Become a station. Luis, may I speak briefly? Oh. Yes, Mario, yeah, sure. yes. Hello, uh, Stan uh, and Luis and everyone. Um, Stan, I just want to express the appreciation I've felt for you and your work over many years that I've known you, not that I've known you very well, uh, but I really relate to your story of uh, you know, the in-betweenness of, uh, of, you know, just even the creation of Chicanismo, the concept of, uh, you know, we're not Mexican-Americans, we're not 
really Americans and we're not Mexicans, what the hell are we, you know? Uh, and uh, just the, uh, well, anyway, I, I, I was also really touched by your, uh, your, your mention of the importance of dreams because dreams are a very important part of my life. Uh, and I was never sure why exactly or where that came from because so many people I know, they say, oh, I, I don't have dreams. I don't, I don't dream at all, you know? And I thought, how is that possible that there are people who don't dream? Uh, and um, so anyway, uh, I don't mean to take up a lot of time, but uh, I just wanted to express my uh, uh, admiration and uh, respect for uh, your many years of work. And uh, you've always been, uh, almost as you said, you know, something different, you know, you're not like, uh, you know, one of those art artists, you're uh, like a philosopher artist. And uh, that's, well, I think one of the key things I have admired in your work. So thank you. And uh, thank you, Luis and uh, Sol Collective for putting on this wonderful presentation. I'll be sure to share it with many people. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. I want to say, I want to say a little bit about dreams uh, because if you don't dream, you will either have depression or anxiety. Think about it. And when I say dreams, I'm not talking about the Western Jungian, Freudian, uh, Euro psycho analysis kind of dreams. I'm talking about indigenous dreaming, Nawalismo. The tonal, the nawal, the conscious and the unconscious. They were working with those principles and it's good for them and we have great respect for uh, all the world's traditions. But we have a little bit different orientation. That's all. You know, and uh, when people say they don't dream, they're just mainly not aware of what's what's going on. Anyway, I hope we could talk about this sometime again, Luis. You're our timekeeper and I think we're getting- Yeah, yeah we have, there are a couple of more questions. I'm gonna uh, ask them. Uh, can you talk more about your 360 vision for your art? And the other question is, along with the video art, are there other medias that you would like to explore as an artist? Oh yeah, all the time. Uh, what I'm doing right now, I'm uh, beginning to work in clay again. I, I began as a clay artist uh, back, uh, I think, 57 I began. Uh, I'm returning to it now, so I'm working in clay. I work in silver and gold uh, and gems and minerals. I, I, I like to go to the source of things. Where do th things emerge? Not just like some people say, the death of the artist was the art store because those are all created, you know, uh, in factories and so forth. Where, where did those things come originally and, and source them, track them all the way back to their beginnings, find the source. A sorcerer always stands or sits in the source of things and interprets to this world at the portal, at the doorway in the in-between. Uh, that's a very complicated situation right there. Uh, I am a paint maker. I am currently working on uh, three uh, public art commissions, a large, almost uh, a stone, new stone sculpture. It's four and a half tons right now for the city of Auburn. I am working on a mural and a clay, uh, a painted mural and a clay mural for the Mercy Compassionate Housing Corporation. These are on tap in my studio right now and I'm working on a new mural for what's called the Miwok Village Elementary School in uh, Elk Grove. It's a new indigenously inspired school where all the walls and everything have all the history. It's all put there, not in books. And so I'm doing the main uh, tonight. In fact, when I get off here, I'll be burning the midnight oil working on that. Um, 
I'm working on a lot of projects all the time. Uh, I have a, thank you, aloha. Uh, always working, you know, and uh, I'm like a juggler. There are many going all the time and then people will say, all of a sudden they'll hit and they go, oh, you've been busy. I go all the time, but like this summer, all these murals, this school mural, the four and a half ton sculpt stone sculpture will all hit and they'll all emerge and then people will see what I've been doing. So I'm, I'm working all the time. Uh, the work I'm doing in clay is uh, uh, I dig my own clay. I'm searching, make my own things. They're, they're pit fire uh, originally, and it's all cookware. I'm interested in original clay work was for cooking and for effigies. What we know is ceramics and pottery and all that is a Euro inspired craft expressionistic funk. I, my question is, you make all these pots, but you don't put anything inside the pots. An empty pot is invitation for something to step in there. We cook in our pots, right? I'm making bean pots. I'm building an uh, outdoor adobe oven. So I'm making all the pottery and the pottery, I mean, the clay is, it comes out of New Mexico. Mica clay is the best for cooking in casserole dishes and comals and things like that. And that's what I'm working on in that I'm not making pretty glazed pots, you know, to sit in uh, somewhere. If it doesn't function, I can't eat it. I'll buy something from someone. Thank, Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Stan. Uh, one last question. When somebody was asking me, you can talk a little bit more about uh, uh, your connection to the blue. Yeah. Uh, I, whoever asked this, if you were there here earlier, when I talked about uh, at six years old, I had a near-death experience. Uh, I, I didn't realize what I was having until I read about it maybe you know, 40 years later in the process of dying and the whole uh, journey, mythological or psychological, psycho-spiritual journey one goes into. But when you get into free space, when you are unencumbered by a body, by connections to family or anything, and you're just floating, journeying, in Star Wars you would call it hyperspace and beyond form, where we go through in that journey through that doorway, it's blue. Think of that picture of the earth and the blue aura. When we leave this earth, we go through the limina liminality of blue. There's a lot of implications. There's a lot of story and history uh, multiculturally uh, about the mystical nature of blue is studied to be the most popular color. People's most famous uh, popular color among all people is, is this blue. Um, I've always worked in it since I was young. I'm really into it now. There's no turning back. You know, I'm really uh, giving all I have. Uh, on my workbench where I make paint, I have all the possible blue colors made into paint now. I make watercolors every color from all over the earth. Two years ago, I was on the border of Afghanistan bringing uh, lapis. I traveled uh, on the Northern Silk Road where lapis was brought down and taken into Italy for the Renaissance. This summer, I'm going to Tuscany, to Italy, following the Silk Road where it hit Italy into the Italian Renaissance when it uh, came into Florence. Uh, the paint making, all of the original stained glass was made from real minerals. Now the stained glass you see today and everything, that's all chemically made. But the, the uh, original stained glass was lapis and gold and 
gems and minerals. The art of glass making was really something. So this summer, that's that's where I'm going to 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 seek out those roots and the uh, where the transnational movement of uh, art art materials of the dark met the dark ages of uh, Europe and the Enlightenment and the uh, Renaissance began. The Renaissance was a multicultural experience, right? The Silk Road brought the Islamic world, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, uh, all of those cultures into Europe for the first time, really. And all of it mixed together for a world, that's why it's called the World Renaissance. So I'll be doing that. And uh, so I'm following the roots there into, uh, I work with paints from that general area that were, uh, I have collected and my daughters have, have brought back from me that the original mines and quarries that Leonardo worked from and, and Michelangelo, uh, Fra Angelico, all of these mystic monks and their paint makers, I inherited all of those and that's what I work with. And when you see my paintings, a lot of that's in there, you know, earth colors, mineral colors, plant colors, you know. Uh, and I'm not a chemist, I'm not a scientist. Really, I have a low grade um, education, actually. I wish I were more uh, academically inclined, but I'm not. So anyway, uh, the blue is inevitable destiny. It's home. It's a, a way to move forward. It is a, it's an action. It's a verb. Blue's not just like a noun, a person or a place or a thing. It's an action. Something happens in the blue. Blue is fugitive. If you don't know how to maintain it uh, with a medium, it's transitory, it won't last. It fades away. That's why the marvels of, uh, of uh, the frescoes of Fra Angelico bringing blue and establishing that at that time is incredible. All the work of, uh, I have studied paint making and uh, the, the uh, fresco work of Diego Rivera a lot for, for decades and uh, studied and, and learned about his paint makers and so forth. But anyway, it's a big story longer than we have time for here today. And I don't hardly know anything. It's kind of a mystery. It's a doorway. You just got to go through it. or paint with it or something. Any more questions or? Um, no, I don't have, uh, there is no more questions in the chat. Okay. Uh, but uh, thank you very much Stan for uh, being here uh, with us tonight for this amazing talk. I uh, thank you everyone that joined us. And I put in the chat the links to uh, to register for the uh, upcoming talks and also I put the link to the online gallery in the chat so you can uh, copy those links and then uh, register for the rest of the talks and the panel discussion and see the online exhibition um, thank you uh, thank you very much once again Stan um, uh, thank, you. thank you everyone and um, I'm humbled uh, and just please know I generally don't talk like this and I don't talk this open, but I think we're in times that we need to, you know, we need to be real and we need to be real soon and real open and real loud now <laughs> because uh, we're at that part of evolution. So thank you all. I hope you'll come visit me one day. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.